last but not least, uh, Volker Bethes, and of course, Volker, you um, are responsible for another slightly troubled part of the world, Sudan. Well, thank you, John. I, I'm not, I'm not even trying to predict the future, but I think what I do is, is I actually tell you a story about Sudan, which I think has some significant elements of possible paths forward. Now, Sudan is more influenced by African developments than by classical Middle Eastern developments, but still I think it is significant what happens in Sudan, or Sudan could be a signifi signifier for developments in the Middle East. The revolution which we have had in Sudan in 2018, 2019, was a real revolution, by the way, um, significant in at least three aspects for this region, Middle East, North Africa. A, it was triggered by the same grievances which people had in the so-called Arab Spring. B, it was a first popular, real popular revolution against an Islamist regime. So a Muslim Brotherhood, Islamists don't have to be successful in revolutions all the time. They could sometimes be at the receiving end, which was the case in Sudan. And C, the Sudanese have learned from the failures of the Arab Spring, very much very actively learned, have learned to avoid the the pass of Syria or the pass of Libya by agreeing and accepting a formula of power sharing between the military, the civilians, and some rebel groups that have joined the fray later. And since that revolution and the agreement on a power sharing formula, Sudan has been in a triple transformation process from authoritarianism to pluralistic democratic governance, from civil wars, basically 60 years of almost uninterrupted civil wars to domestic peace and also from economic mismanagement and high debts to economic recovery and more equitable development. Now, will Sudan succeed? I don't know. I'm just working for the success, but I don't know. I'm pretty sure it can. The Sudanese can. We are halfway through that transition period, which is supposed to end by January 2024. The record so far, as you couldn't expect otherwise, is mixed, but I would say the glass is certainly fuller than empty. Um, the record is more positive so far than negative. Peace agreements have been signed with the main rebel movements. Of course, implementation is a challenge and takes time. Uh, the economy is recovering after having been in free fall. The main difficult part, but also the most interesting dimension of this transition for this region, for the Middle East and North Africa, is a political transition. It's the most difficult, because power sharing between the military and the civilians, A, it is rather exceptional in this part of the world, both the Middle East and Africa, and also this power sharing arrangement is not a marriage of love. It's not even a marriage of convenience. It is, at best, a marriage of reason built of the reasonable realization that one part cannot do without the other or one part cannot do away with the other without risking the entire country and risking domestic peace. It's a messy transition and you wouldn't expect it to be otherwise and just in the last two weeks we have had a couple of attempts to reset the balance of forces in Sudan. Why is it significant for the rest of of for the Middle East and North Africa. Hey, all the elements which we have in the Sudanese microcosm, as it were, are present in this larger region of Middle East and North Africa. We have authoritarianism or the remnants of authoritarianism that resist change. We have rent-seeking dysfunctional economies that resist change and reform. We have, um, Bernardino already mentioned that, we have an extremely young population, which can be a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. And we have, and I insist on saying that because I think it is so important, we have a society that is much more connected to the world, much more technology savvy, much more open to the world than the old elites that were overthrown in the coup or first and then the revolution of 2019. So if Sudan can succeed in this transition with, with very difficult starting points economically, then I think the rest of the region can too. Which brings me to, very briefly, to the geopolitical picture. Sudan, as I said in the beginning, is much more influenced by developments in Africa, Ethiopia, Chad, South Sudan, than it is by developments in the classical 
Middle East. And the question for me, and it's, it's, it's probably an academic question to an extent, is whether this concept of Middle East, North Africa, um, will still be relevant in 2030. Or isn't it rather um, that we will have different sub-regions with different orientations, different levels of integration? And indeed, I think that the answer to the question of which geographical concepts or geopolitical concepts apply in 2030 lies in the patterns of integration and connectivity. So it could well be that parts of North Africa are much more part of a wider European economic space than of a MENA region. It could well be that the Gulf is a much stronger player in the Indian Ocean in Africa than in North Africa or the classical Middle East. And it could well be, and I hope it will, that Sudan will be a center of integration in East Africa. And influence, political influence, will come through connectivity and linkages rather than the traditional ways of buying off your clients in a neighboring country and subverting the neighbor if possible. So to conclude, I think the Gulf states, and since we are in the Emirates and we're happy that we're here, the Gulf states would have a great opportunity to help peaceful development, not only in Sudan, but in the entire sub-region by thinking about connectivity and linkages, by not only investing in port structures, port infrastructure, I know the UAE is doing that along the African coast, but also the linkages between the ports and the deeper inner side of Africa, as it were, by linkages through rail and road, for example, to the landlocked neighbors of Sudan, Chad, Central African Republic, South Sudan, and Ethiopia, and thereby making Sudan not only a center of integration, but also a pillar of stability and regional development. And finally, if I may, any advice to regional and international players who see that the situation in Sudan and in many other countries is still fluid, is indeed invest geoeconomically in connectivity. It helps your economic interest and the interest of the countries you're investing in and invest politically in institutions and power sharing rather, in, rather than in trying to find your own clients or try to manipulate political outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Volker. Um...